today, I am going to introduce Ms. Uh, my name is Elisa Dieta, and I would like to welcome you to the second installment of the Financial Literacy Speaker Series. Today's session is entitled, Till Death Will Do Us Part. If you haven't guessed yet, uh, the topic is all about relationships and money. So before we start, I would like to thank our sponsors. They are California Coast Credit Union, the Mesa College Foundation, San Diego Financial Literacy Center, Associated Students, and California Burritos. <laughs> Thank you to each of our great sponsors. Now, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Lori Itkin. Lori Itkin is a financial advisor, wealth manager, and certified divorce financial analyst. She is also the author of the best-selling book, Every Woman Should Know Her Options, Invest Your Way to Financial Empowerment. Invisopedia named Ms. Itkin one of the top 100 most influential financial advisors in the country. Ooh, As a wealth manager at Coastwise Capital Group, Ms. Itkin manages the investments of clients' brokerage, trust, and retirement accounts. Through her financial counseling uh, company, The Options Lady, that's her company that she runs, where she provides divorce-related financial planning and analysis to individuals and couples who are going through the stages of, divorce pro of the divorce process. Ms. Itkin frequently appears as a guest expert in investing and personal finance on television, radio, and podcasts. She has also been quoted in numerous publications, including the San Diego Union Tribute, Chicago Tribute, U.S. News and World Reports, and Forbes. She was also a contributing writer in the AOL Daily Finance. Ms. Itkin is a national expert on, a, on women and investing and speaks at conferences and seminars throughout the country. She has a talent for communicating arcane economic and investing subjects in, language that, in a language that everyone can understand. She volunteers as a pro bono financial planner for the San Diego Financial Literacy Center and mentors women launching new businesses as a board member for Hera Labs Business Accelerator. She earned her BS in Economics with a concentration in Finance from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Please make welcome to Lori Inkin. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Uh, so I love to make any talk I do, very informal, love to take questions, comments, really let's make it more, let's make it fun and active. And um, thank you so much for being here. I know we have a lot going on on campus, uh, not to mention the historical day of the Judge Kavanaugh hearings. So uh, I know we'll all, all be tuning in uh, after I leave here. I'll be listening to National Public Radio on my way home in the car. So, so. What I want to talk about today is, and, and Professor Eskew gave me the title, Till Debt Do Us Part, and so I expanded it and thought today I could discuss uh, money issues in dating, marriage, and divorce, recognizing that most of you aren't at that point yet, and I hope you don't get to be at that point. But also, um, since I have written a book, a best-selling book about investing really geared toward women. I'm really happy to take questions about that as well, if we have time. So I always, I want to say that today's presentation is educational in nature, so even though if we do talk about investing, I'm not giving any legal tax or investment advice, it's purely educational, and I might use some examples. All right, so as was said in the introduction, a little bit about me. I'm a financial advisor and wealth manager at Coastwise Capital Group, which is a boutique independent investment advisory firm in La Jolla. So my day-to-day -day job is managing people's trust accounts, their brokerage accounts, their retirement accounts. And I pick, I'm a portfolio manager, so I actually pick the stocks and bonds the exchange traded funds, I use some options for some income generation and downside protection. What I uh, got about three years ago, I got a designation as a CDFA, which is a Certified Divorce Financial Analyst. What is that? It's a fairly new profession 
and specialty, you'll find that wealth managers like myself or um, certified financial planners, some CPAs will get this designation and it allows us as a certified divorce financial analyst, it allows us to work with couples who are contemplating divorce, going through the divorce or transitioning financially to single life. Because when you get divorced in California, we are what's called a community property state and it's presumed that community assets will be spent at, will be split 50-50. Sometimes it's hard to do that if there's a house that you both own and there are retirement accounts. You can't really split a house down the middle. So if somebody wants to, one spouse wants to retain the house, they may have to buy the other spouse out and trade assets for it. So I, I'm the kind of person that helps this designation can help you really understand what is fair, what is 50-50, and allow you to negotiate. So there's my book, Every Woman Should Know Her Options. I talk about my personal story. When I was 24 years old, I received a $1,600 inheritance from my grandmother. And although I wanted to spend it on clothes and shoes, like any woman would that gets a windfall of that money, uh, I had already been laid off twice, and I knew that I really needed to do something for my future security. So I was 24 years old, and I bought my first shares of stock. I made my first stock investment. And in the book, I talk about how I continued to really save and live below my means, and every few months buy a little more stock and more stock. And I started at 24. And anytime I got a windfall, windfall, like, you know, if a great aunt sent me a check for $25, I'd put that towards buying more stock. And by the time I was 40, I had built a million dollar portfolio between stocks and between my retirement accounts at work, really trying to max out on my 401k. So I want to tell you, the sooner you can start investing, the better. It really adds up. It really does. And <coughs> things are different now. I'm 50 years old. I was 24 at the time. Now we have so much information online. We have robo-advisors. We have financial advisors in every corner. It's so easy now for you to get started. And I tell people, even if you can only do like $20 a paycheck, do it. And if you get a raise, and as you grow in your career, then up it, you know, up it. That's what I did. And so I talk about in my book some of the strategies I've used. <coughs> and the best way to find me is my website, theoptionslady.com. All right, so what we're going to talk about today is money and relationships in these scenarios, from dating to marriage to some people divorce. Okay. Money issues while dating. Um, all right, I got giggles already. I like it's interactive. So if you're if you're willing to share to make this fun, what what is the giggle? Oh, the second bullet point. She 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 jumped ahead. Very good. Okay. So um, raise your hand if you think a man should pay on the first date. Okay, okay, and uh, raise your hand if you think a woman should pay on the first date. Okay, <laughs> we were equal opportunity. Because I believe you think that whoever asked the other person out should pay for the date. Yeah, that's Is that right? Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, in the old days, it was obviously, the, you know, a man paid for a woman. And I have to tell you that even in today's day and age, so I told you, I'm 50 years old, and a few years I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who is older than me, so she was probably 50 at the time, and she makes a lot of money. She's an executive, she's a director level position, she has her own house, she's investment real estate, and she insists that still the man should pay on the date. Mm -hmm. And I said, Susan, you probably make three times as much money as some of the men you might be dating. Why, are, <laughs> why, are, why is he supposed to pay for you? So we have the old, uh, traditional patterns, um, but I really think, you know, think about it, and, and especially when you're dating a couple of times, I really think you guys should try to 
men and women should try to share, share the load, right? Just as if you would go with a friend. If I go have a drink with a friend, you know, whose turn is it? My turn, your turn, or we'll split it. Okay, bullet number two, what the what young woman was laughing about. So many people are ready and willing to go to bed with another person and get sexually intimate when they really don't know much about the person. Now, if you are going to have a relationship, if this is a short-term thing, fine, but if you are going to be having a relationship with this person, the financial issues are so important, you really need to know what you're getting into. Do you share similar goals and values? Um, I know that it would be very difficult, because I see it all the time, for somebody who loves to spend money, that's going to be very, a very difficult relationship if they're in love with somebody who is a huge saver. Somebody who lives for the now versus somebody who lives for the future. I see it all the time here in San Diego. A lot of people want to have the fancy cars and you know buy the nice clothes and go on the nice trips. And when I see them, when they get divorced, they have very little equity in their house because they've refinanced their mortgage many times to take cash out, or they have very little in their retirement plans. And I have to tell you, if you are 50 or 60 years old and you don't have much in a retirement plan, that's telling you and me that you're probably going to have to work until you drop. So you don't want that situation. Uh, is he or she, they, a financial mess? Really, like you don't want to be with somebody who's a financial mess. It's okay if they have student loan debt, you know, good debt. Your student loan shows that you are making an investment in yourself, right? But if they've got tons of credit card debt, that tells me that maybe they spend more than they earn. Or they, and I remember, how did I have a, how did I become a millionaire before I was 40? One simple tip, I lived below my means. You want to be in a relationship with somebody who does not spend more than comes into the household than they make, if you can. I know it's tough, but it's something to think about. And how much debt does this person have, right? I mean, what kind of debt, how much debt? Uh, I mean, I, I just, with so many couples that I meet, they have tons of credit card debt, high interest rates. If, if you've got $20,000 in credit card debt and you're paying 18% or 22% a year, how are you ever going to be able to save for things because you're constantly paying off that credit card bill? And here's a big one. We have people marrying later in life, many second marriages. If you are thinking about living together or getting married, you, it's very important that you know what your new spouse's obligations are to the, the former spouse or the family. So if I'm a woman and I'm marrying somebody and he has kids from a previous marriage, I'm going to want to know, and I think it's fair for me to ask, how much child support do you pay every month? Are you paying spousal support? When does this end? How are you going to have the ability to save? You know, because it's very, it's hard to support all these households. So I think it's fair game to ask those questions at the appropriate time. All right, money discussion before marriage. And I'd like to make this interactive. Um, tell me, I think most of us have heard of prenuptial agreements. Can you tell me any one, just what does this mean to you? Like, what have you heard about prenups? Any thoughts or experiences or, okay, so you and then, all, then you. Uh, you're protecting your assets, kind of like um, you're splitting them or you're defining who's, is, who's before the marriage and before you kind of like mix each other's income. Right, so I'll, re I'll repeat what the answer was so everyone can hear. Uh, what was your name? Miguel. Miguel, hi Miguel. So what Miguel was saying is that a prenuptial agreement will help identify what are your assets and debts and what are your future spouse's assets and debts. Identify them, have agreement on them, and then set rules about as we earn money together or spend money together as a couple or as we say a community, how that will be addressed in the event of a divorce. You had a thought. Yeah, so just kind of to piggyback off that idea is just before you get married to kind of the money that you made before is yours, and then once you start a marriage, that's when you begin to do like 
the joint money. Yeah, so to, to clarify um, and, and highlight what you said, the prenup to be used to say, to acknowledge the money you made before, which may be savings now or retirement or in a house, is your separate property and then what you earn together as a marriage is gonna be the community property. And why this is important is if you get divorced, the presumption in California is that community property which is what you own or owe with your spouse is subject to 50-50 division. That's a presumption. So if you have separate property that you believe is yours not to be split with your spouse, there are, there are you, you have a need to show that and trace your separate property. So a prenuptial agreement helps you do this. Why it's really important is we, as we delay marriage later in life, we've established our own net worth probably or negative net worth if we are in debt beyond our assets. And it's really important to, to know that and go through the exercise so you know what, what you know, here's, here's my stuff, here's your stuff. Very important. Um, and it also becomes really important because we have, you know, people say, I have students will say, people in their early 20s, I don't need a prenuptial agreement because I don't have anything. All I have is student loans. But in the prenuptial agreement, you can really set forth what will happen. So if one of you, if your dream is to have three children and your dream is to be a stay-at-home mother, well, you need to protect yourself because that means unless you get childcare, you are going to be giving up your career, taking time out of the workforce. And when a woman or a man, because there are plenty of male stay-at-home men and caregivers, when you step out of the workforce to raise children, you are not contributing to the Social Security, your Social Security. You may not be contributing to a retirement plan, and you're certainly <coughs> reducing your future earning potential because let's say you go back to work at 50. Well, you may not, had you stayed in the workforce all the time, you may be a VP in a company earning $200,000 a year, but now you've got to come as, as an analyst or whatever making 60000 a year. So these are the things that a prenup helps you to discuss and, and set forth. It's also very important if you own real estate, very important. Okay, who pays for what? You need to discuss this when you're about to get married or even when you're living together. If one of you makes more than the other person, is it fair to say we each contribute 50-50 to joint expenses like groceries, restaurants, utilities? Or maybe it makes more sense for your situation to say, I earn more than my future spouse, so I will contribute 70% of my income into the joint account, and he or she will contribute 30 then you also have to get clarity on who pays for what. What is a joint expense? So are you going to, when you go and you get a haircut, is that going to come from your personal account or is that a joint expense? What if your spouse loves the latest and greatest gadget and every time Apple has a new iPhone release, they got to buy that iPhone. Well, how, you know, is that joint? Are you paying for this jointly? I don't have the answer for you. But I always say communication early on about spending and saving habits and values will really decrease the likelihood of money arguments. And divorce and unhappy marriages are, are caused by usually two things, money and what do you think the other one is? <laughs> Infidelity. Infidelity, yep. So, those are the ones, sex and the money. I can't control the sex, but I can help you about the money. <laughs> um, it's also, with, we, we have so many apps now, it's so easy. Have any of you, raise your hand if you've heard of mint.com. Oh, wow, a lot of you. I love mint.com. Um, mint is a great way where you can just electronically connect your credit cards, your bank account, your mortgage, any any financial payments that are going back and forth, you can use mint.com to just pull everything together and then it tells you, now you have to help it because you have to help it know different categories, 
but that's a great way that you can track what you spend your money on. So um, you can also, if you don't want to use Mint, you can also look at your annual online statement. You'll get most of the banks now have an annual spending summary where they will um, divide it either by month. Sometimes you can download it to a spreadsheet or you can just look online. But you can figure out, wow, I spent $2,000 this year on gas on my commute. Wow, I spent $600 this year at Starbucks. Wow. Or I spent this pet, you know, the pet, my God, I didn't, I didn't know how, how expensive it was to have a dog and all this food. So that allows you and your soon-to-be spouse to talk about what you and he or she spend money on. And, and just, you know, it's just a transparency, and I'll talk about, <coughs> about more about that later. Um, but building a budget, and that'll come up. And like I said, will one spouse put their career on hold to raise children? Wow, because as I, I said in, in the professor's uh, class, uh, since I deal with a lot of, I work with a lot of divorcing couples, a big issue is when, you know, let's say the woman stayed home to take care of the kids and they get a divorce and now she's 50 years old and she, she can't earn much and, and sometimes income will be imputed. So for instance, um, it will be stated that you may not have a job now, but you can certainly earn minimum wage and so an income will be imputed, meaning that you will get less child and or spousal support than you would if you had no income, right? So, so there's always discussions when couples are getting divorced, especially because our state has spousal support in many cases, and you know the person paying the spousal support will say, well, my ex-spouse is smart, they have an education, they can work, why should I be paying monthly payments for this person when they're not working? Well, sometimes if you've stayed home to raise children and put your career on hold, your future earning capability is at risk. So, now it's a lot to think about early on, but it needs to be thought about. Any questions on any of these before I go on? Any comments? <coughs> Personal experiences? <laughs> okay. All right. Minimizing money fights in marriage. Two rules, be transparent and don't judge. I'm very good in my marriage about being transparent. I'm not very good about judging because, you know, ta take two people, right? Take two people. One person will say, I have to have nice fingernails. I mean, I have to. I mean, I can't, I have to, I, every three weeks I must get my nails done. I have to. And the spouse will be like, why? Nobody looks at your fingers. Who cares? You know, you could be saving, you know, 40 bucks a month and putting it in your retirement plan. I mean, or I can look at my husband's car and say, why do you need a $60,000 car? You could have bought a used car for $20,000. No two people are going to have the same values about what money means to them. And that's why if you are going to be <coughs> sharing finances with your partner, You've got to be transparent about what, how you all think about money and what's important to you. Because you will never agree on everything. I really have never seen anyone totally agree on everything. And you've got to compromise and you've got to learn how to talk with your spouse about that. And we give and take. You know, I remember when I first, um, it's a funny story, when I first actually moved in with my spouse and then we got married, and at the time he wasn't my spouse. Um, he, we decided that the groceries would be on the joint account. And I had always been very frugal about my groceries. And I made a lot of beans, you know, beans are cheap and all that. And then all of a sudden he goes to Jimbo's, which is an organic grocery, you know Jimbo's? <laughs> it's an organic, organic grocery store near where we live. And all of a sudden he comes home and he spent $12 on four peaches. <laughs> what? And I, he starts munching, munching. I go, that's $3. She just bit right through it. And he would go out and go, and so I couldn't believe how expensive all this organic fruit was. And I had a big fight. And he said to me, Laurie, you know what? Most wives would be thrilled that their husbands are healthy and eat well. And what's more important than me putting good stuff in my body? 
Good point, right? <coughs> wow, I changed my mind. Actually, it wasn't that easy. It took me about three years to get used to it. <laughs> okay, now I eat that stuff too. Ah, all right. <laughs> but that's so, it's really important, you know. And I did judge, um, and people judge. And a lot of people, I've noticed with um, divorcing couples, sometimes, sometimes, it's, it's often the wife, when this happens, um, the wife will accuse the husband of hiding money. I know he has more money. I know he has accounts I don't know about, right? I know. Well, basically, if you were transparent all along, you'd know. You know, so I see in, in couples, you know, one spouse, that's why I go back to work together on the tax returns. And it's some men too are in the dark. You know, usually in one, in a marriage, one spouse really takes control over the financial issues, over making sure the taxes are filed, making sure the bills are paid, making sure the investments are done. But I really encourage you to do this as a shared activity. You know, you go out to restaurants together as a couple, you raise children together as a couple, you should manage the finances together as a couple. And it's fine if one person takes the lead on something, but there should always be bringing the other spouse up so they're on a level playing field. And so with tax returns, a lot of people do them on TurboTax. Some people might use a CPA or an enrolled agent. So many times the other spouse doesn't even know, doesn't know how to read a tax return, doesn't even know what it means, doesn't know how much income is coming in, doesn't know anything about the mortgage deduction. Really, this is financial literacy 101, is to every year just spend a half an hour to an hour going through <coughs> the major forms on the tax return, itemized deductions. If you have a small business, if you're self-employed, there may be a Schedule C, <coughs> or if you have an S-Corp, there, there may be other, other paperwork, but it's really good to know your financial health. Same thing with a financial advisor. A lot of times, since people get married late in life, they may already be working with a financial advisor. Well, it's really important to talk about, do we want to use the same financial advisor? Some couples, they each want their own financial advisor. That's fine, but be transparent with each other. Uh, I think I talked about um, Mint and stuff, but it's really good if once a month you can review with your spouse, your credit card, and bank statements. You're not going to do it once a month, but if you try to do it once a month, if you can hopefully do it two or three times a year, that'll be great. And then again, don't judge, be transparent, and try to see the other person's side about why they thought it was important to spend this money. It, it, it may create fights, but at least you're transparent about it. Um, I used the other, an example in the, in the class previously about help your spouse save money. Many times, situation, one person's very busy working and they buy lunch, uh, they go out to lunch every day or they'll grab something. And if, you know, I've noticed if salads and sandwiches and stuff, they're, they're going up in price, it would not be unheard of to spend 10 or $12 a day on lunch. And if you spend $12 five days a week on lunch, that's $60 a week, 52 weeks in the year, assuming you have two weeks of vacation, that's $3,000 a year you've spent on outside lunch. If this concerns you, because 3,000 could be going into a college savings plan for a child, right? Or your retirement plan, if it concerns you, then um, as Professor Eskew has said, he and his wife cook on Sunday nights and they make extras and then they have lunches to take, you know? Just, it's, uh, it's, it's really a good idea. It just means you need to plan and take some time. And then you can build a budget together once you know what the expenses are. And this is big, this is a big argument about money I see that um, one spouse will complain, oh my gosh, it's Christmas time and my spouse just went to Macy's and you know spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars and all these gifts and then she probably bought clothes for herself and then what is it, you know? <laughs> this and that, so and it's very important that you and your spouse agree to a level on spending on which you will need consent or not. I mean, I'm not suggesting that when you go to the grocery store, you have to call your spouse up and say, hey, can I spend $80 on groceries? But if you're gonna be making a big ticket item, that you know, you'll have a threshold. Like if, if some couples, they say, 
you can spend up to $500, you don't need to call me first. But like my husband knew to call me because this man likes to barbecue and we have two grills already, we have two. I don't even know the difference. I guess one's charcoal, one's electric, I don't even know. And then he calls me from Ace Hardware. He loves Ace Hardware, he's always at Ace Hardware. He probably goes, Laurie, there's this great deal on it. And I go, oh, I hear there's a great deal. I'm like, oh my gosh. And he wanted to get yet another barbecue. And he explained because he likes the mesquite, this and that, I don't even know. And I just said, how much? And he said, well, um, you know, $1,200. But there's a sale, and I'm like, okay, how much is it with the sale? And he said, well, that is the sale, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, do you really need this? So, okay, so he knew, because he was going to put that bugger on the joint account, and he knew I would have blown a gasket if I came home and I saw, you know, that on the joint account. So it's important to determine what you guys are going to spend your own money on and when you should consult your spouse before making a major purchase. Um, any comments, stories, anecdotes on on this? Any thoughts, questions? Did yes. Did he buy them? <laughs> no, he did not buy it. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I and I, um, I somehow escaped the summer. I don't know how I did it. I mean, like I think he probably called. Yes, we got through the summer. So that we know, I probably won't have to deal with it till next April. <laughs> yeah, which is great. We save money. That money can be invested, right? That can be invested for the future. I know he in the back. He wants that grill. I know you want that grill, right? <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> so okay, when you are married, especially if you don't have a prenup, then you need to protect yourself during marriage, okay? Um, the number one thing to do, because we are a community property state, that means that, I like to explain this, this generally means that anything you owed or owed prior to marriage is your separate property. Anything that you acquired or um, borrowed during the marriage is community property and then once you actually separate, even if the divorce isn't final, after separation, whatever you do then is separate property. So I'll give you an example. There's a very um, famous court case about this, but just to give you an example, let's say, let's say I'm married and we're not, it's not going well, but we're married and I win the lottery. Mm -hmm. It has been known, there's a court case on this, that um, spouse may try to hide that from the other spouse, thinking that, you know, the marriage is on the brink, right? No, anytime you earn something like that during marriage, that is community property. You need to know that is going to be split 50-50 with your spouse unless there's certain circumstances. But after you've separated and there's a formal separation that you've it's um there's a debate over what that means but let's say you have said to your spouse we are their marriage is irreconcilable we're not going to get back together i'm moving out we are separated i want to get a divorce even if you haven't filed for the divorce if you are separated and you win the lottery the next day that's probably your separate property meaning you don't have to share 50 50 with your spouse okay this is, this is just a general guideline, but you would be not surprised when I have couples coming to me, at, you, either I work as a neutral with a couple trying to figure out you know, what's 50-50, or I work with one spouse. I can't tell you how many times, let's say there's a stay-at-home mom and uh, the husband got some restricted stock or options through his job, these are worth a lot of money in some cases. And, you know, most of that probably is 50-50 to be split 50-50 depending on when and some conditions on timing. But he comes to meet with me and he says, I said, well, when is your date of separation? He was very concerned that she get half of this money. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I said, well, when is your date of separation? He said, four years ago. And I said, four years ago, but don't you still live in the same house as your spouse? And you were separated four years ago? 
And, and the reason why he wanted the Davis separation to be way back when is because all this money he had gotten now, he would not have to share with her if it was after the Davis separation. Meanwhile, it's in her best interest to say, we were never separated. Maybe he moved out for one day, but he came back because she wants that Davis separation farther along. So many cases when you're married, <laughs> one spouse will say the date of separation was very different than the other spouses and that's where you, you should go to mediation or you might even need lawyers to hash it out. Um, so just something to think about. You really, when you're getting married, you should understand the separate and community property laws in the state and if you don't have a prenuptial agreement, you are agreeing to the laws of the state. People think if I don't sign a prenup, well, okay, that's, everything's fine. No, you are agreeing to our state law, and our state law, in many cases, is not very fair. <laughs> it may sound fair, but it, it may not feel fair. Um, so, if you don't have a prenup, if you were to receive an inheritance during marriage, If you want to protect that separate property, if you don't want to have to split that with your spouse down the road, you want to make sure you have excellent records showing it's separate property. So let's just say um, uh, Miguel's uncle dies. I'll, I'll use Miguel, is that okay? <laughs> Miguel's uncle dies. And Miguel was such a wonderful nephew, and Miguel's been married for three years, and Miguel's nephew or uncle dies, and Miguel gets $100,000 from his uncle, all right? Miguel would be best served to put that, open up a separate bank account in Miguel's names only, not Miguel and the spouse, not a joint account, make it clear and keep records when the money from the inheritance went into Miguel's account. Miguel should make sure not to co-mingle his separate property with other property. So for instance, if Miguel starts paying some household bills or private school tuition for the kids out of that $100,000 account, it could be considered a community purpose, okay? so. What I would advise Miguel is probably, first of all, you know, probably talk to an estate planning attorney just to get clarity over it, but Miguel might want to keep a separate account that he never adds to and never withdraws from. If you really want to be safe, you can invest that money, but it needs to be kept separate. Oftentimes, somebody will receive an inheritance and then they'll say, well, uh, we need new kitchen cabinets or we need to upgrade our bathroom and I'll just put that in the house and I'll, I'll get it back if anything ever happens. If you start, if that house is owned jointly, you are going to have, and you divorce, you are going to have the burden of proof to show that your separate property went into that house, how it went to the house. You need to prove records that you paid the cabinet company, you need to show records because it will be presumed to be 50-50. And if, you, let's say, Miguel puts $100,000 into the house and the house appreciates by a lot more than the 100000 that he put in, there's going to be some tracing and figuring out if he has to split any of that with his wife or not. So try to keep gifts separate because it will be presumed if you start commingling, it is presumed that you made a gift to your spouse. Refinancing, um, when interest rates were going down, a lot of couples refinanced their mortgages. It's because you know, I know a lot of people now with 30 year fixed mortgages at 3.75%, that's pretty good. Now interest rates are going up, but people refinance. And sometimes the lender will require that both spouses be on title, um, and that maybe both spouses be on the mortgage. Let's say one spouse's um, income isn't enough to qualify, so maybe you can get a better rate if you have the other spouse on there. But when you're doing a refinance, you may be transmuting the property. So again, it's going when you do any type of major thing on real estate, you really should consult um, with a with an attorney or a, or a CDFA. That's what I do, a certified divorce financial analyst or a trust attorney, just to make sure you know what you're doing and your spouse knows what you're doing. So there's no arguments later if the marriage 
ends up in divorce. It's also important if you have children from a previous marriage, maybe you want this house going to the children. You're going to have to work that out, you know, and you have a new spouse who's the step parent, so it gets complicated. Uh, keep pre-marriage records. What I'm doing right now, I, I've spent eight hours in the case now. I'm working with a couple where um, the husband you, um, got a lot of incentive stock options. They don't even, those are rare anymore, but he got them like in between 2000 and 2007. They were awarded or he exercised them, but he got married in 2005. Now I've been hired to try to trace back how much was actually his because now those are gone, right? They were cashed out. He had put them into Union Bank, then moved and put them in a certificate of deposit, and then over the years has moved that money how many times into different certificates of deposit, and here I am trying to figure out and helping him trace his separate property. Because if he can't trace this, everything is presumed to be community property subject to 50-50. Same thing with his house. He owned a house before marriage. He was title on the house. He was the only mortgager. Do you know his ex-spouse gets some of that money, she gets some equity from the home because while they were married, even though she did not work, the community paid down the mortgage. So his ex, his soon to be ex-wife gets an equity, gets money out of the house even though she never bought the house, she was never on the mortgage. See how complicated this can be? <laughs> That's again why I say prenuptial agreements are very useful and even if you don't sign the prenuptial agreement, it gives you, even if you decide not to do it, you talk to an attorney and you get some sense on what to expect if divorce happens. Um, keep pre-marriage records. Like I said, his records aren't very good, unfortunately, because you know, it was 13, I mean, more than 30, they were married 13 years ago. Okay, um, this is controversial, but I always recommend return to the workforce as soon as possible after having children because if you take time off to raise kids, you, I know childcare is very expensive. I have many mothers say to me, it's, it's, it's less expensive for me to stay at home than it would be if I worked, you know, I'd pay, I'd pay more in childcare than if I worked to earn a salary. But she's forgetting her investment in herself and being in the workforce because you get more experience when you're in the workforce earning money and that means your future earning ability may be better. So when they get divorced, if she's only, eight, first of all, she doesn't have a job, she's in her 50s, she's unable to earn a high income, the ch she may, may or may not get child support, maybe the children are older, over 18, so there's no child support from her husband and she may get some spousal support but spousal support does not always go on for life. It often has an end date, and she's going to be left high and dry. I have a whole online course about this. I have an online course that teaches women. Some men, again, I, I, I use women because in most of the cases it's the woman, but I have worked with couples where the woman is the, bro the breadwinner, the, the husband is taking care of the kids. And obviously, I, I, in same-sex couples, it doesn't matter the gender. I'm working um, with a, a, a same-sex couple right now who's getting divorced, and they, it doesn't matter if they were heterosexual. It's the same issues. I stayed home to raise the son for these years, then I went back to work and you stayed home to raise, and there are requirement accounts of different balances, and one spouse makes more income than the other now, one spouse is older, concerned about retirement. So it doesn't even matter your gender. This is just uh, marriage and divorce. Um, I always encourage to contribute to retirement accounts because that stuff will grow, and then try to keep debt as low as possible. If you Student loan debt is a reality, and at least you're making an investment in your health, yourself. Some people buy more house than they can afford because they rationalize my mortgage interest is tax deductible, my property tax is tax deductible, and now under the new, the new tax law, your deductions are limited, especially with regarding um, property tax, so, and interest rates are higher. So it's not always a great idea to buy a house with a big mortgage, right? People always think, well, this is tax deductible, blah, blah, blah. I'll, so try to keep your debt low if possible. Uh, any thoughts or questions on, on all this? In the back? <laughs> no, no? Okay. Okay, I have a question right here. So a lot of what you're speaking about um, pertains 
relates to specifically the, the contract of marriage. Yes. Um, how about for folks who are adulting together but not married? Yes. Um, well, great. So in terms of, in fact, you know, in some cases, it's almost an argument for just living together, not for getting married, honestly. I mean, that's, I think a lot of couples we're seeing are not getting married. You know, they may even raise children together and, and live together. You will still, I think what I said earlier about um, having a joint account and separate accounts, you know, you're living together, you still have to decide what costs are joint, what we will each pay for. Um, if one person makes more income than the other or it's higher student loan debt, you know, debt payments, what's a fair amount to contribute to joint expenses? So um, you still have the issues of budgeting with, with a person. Do you have any, any other comments or questions to delve deeper into that? Um, I guess because there are certain um, legal ramifications to marriage, are there any instances in which those apply outside of marriage? Yeah, so great, great question. So um, when you are buying property with somebody you're not married to, it's important that, that you understand what that means. And I'm not an expert on that, but how the title is set up. Um, certainly, um, a lot of people now are getting what's called cohabitation agreements. It's sort of like a prenuptial agreement, but, but not really. Um, so I also would say when you're living together, um, you know, one of you, it's, it's very interesting, it's, it's, it's also very important because let's say one of you can afford to put more into a retirement account than the other person, because you're, you're gonna be arguing about your budget. Where does this fixed amount of money go? And unfortunately, if you're not married and your spouse has been socking away in retirement and you haven't, you leave with yours very little retirement. Now there's issues like community law, marriage, and all that, but I don't, I don't really. Um, those are those vary by state, sir. Yeah, so states have a common law, but right? No, oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, exactly. So that it, it, it varies by state. If you don't, if you don't, don't have that license, you can still get some more money. Right? The, the what? The like? Uh, even if you don't have a marriage marriage license. In some states, correct. That's correct. So, for instance, I know in Pennsylvania they might have changed the law law recently on that. So it is something to be. To, to understand the laws in your states regarding what he said, the common law marriage. Yeah. So it's it's hard. You know, maybe it's best if you just both have your own paths. <laughs> then everything's then everything's clean. Um, any other questions or comments about this? How about the civil, civil union? Civil union. Yeah. Uh, you mean like domestic registered? I don't know whether California has it. Um, does anyone know about? I mean, we. So I'm not up to date exactly on that. I know um, with same-sex couples, they were, could only be registered domestic partners. But now same-sex couples in this state, well obviously, I mean, it's, it's legal now. Um, the Defense of Marriage Act was struck down, right? So, um, so I know that, I know that in, in the same-sex couple that I'm working with now, we are treating their date of marriage for purposes of assets, you know, splitting retirement assets as the date they became registered partners, even though their marriage was only three years ago. So it's very interesting. All I mean, these are the things to totally to think about to understand your state laws. I mean, that's a great, a great question with um, common law, people that have lived together for so many years. I'm just not an expert on that. I'm an expert on divorce, but not on common law. <laughs> But I always ask that, in fact, you know, a friend of mine asked me, she's been living with her boyfriend for years. He owns the house. She doesn't really contribute much to the household. And she's always asked me, if we break up, do I get anything? <laughs> I said, you know, you've got to talk to a lawyer. But probably doubtful. I don't know. Um, so if you are in the unfortunate situation of getting a divorce, these are the things to, and I do suggest, so if you have, you know, friends or family, you know, that's considering this, we have great resources in San Diego. We have something that's been around for a while called the Second Saturday Workshop, um, and they have different locations around the city. I volunteer sometimes, 
and it's a four-hour workshop where you come in on a Saturday, it's the second Saturday of every month, hence second Saturday, and you come in and you hear um, about the legal issues of divorce, the financial issues of divorce. Sometimes they bring a therapist in to talk about parenting issues. I also volunteer the, um, the, uh, the uh, divorce mediation group downtown also holds a similar workshop called Divorce 101. And I come in sometimes and my fellow um, CDFA, Certified Divorce Financial Analyst, come in and we talk about you know, what separate versus community property is. We talk about with child and spousal support, it's very difficult to determine income available for support if one or both spouses are self-employed. Maybe they get 1099 income. What about a big issue we find since we are in a uh, educational institution are pensions. How do you divide pension in a divorce? And, and how much is the other spouse entitled to? This is very, very important stuff. So preparing for divorce is very important. And you are actually mandated under state law to disclose all your assets, debt, income, and expenses. Now, you should be truthful. Are people always truthful? I hope they are. But a lot of people don't even know what they have. They just are not trying to lie. They just don't even know. Like, for instance, a life insurance policy, there may be life insurance policies where there's a cash value, where if you stop paying the payments and wanted to take cash out, you might get ten, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 out. That's an asset that might be to be split 50-50. Um, so I always suggest um, we as a certified divorce analyst, and there's more and more, the designation's becoming more and more popular, so you'll see more and more people getting it. But um, a CDFA, we usually charge less than a lawyer. So if you meet with us first, either as a couple or individually, we can help sort of educate you on, on the house, how the house will be addressed, how the pension will be addressed, the retirement accounts, what is separate property, we can also run scenarios on what might be um, child or spousal support numbers based on you know, your health insurance deductions. Do you have a mortgage deduction? So there's calculators that can help. So like I said, you've got to understand the difference between separate and community property, very, very important. And a lot of people in a divorce, they'll negotiate assets by emotion. So many women insist on keeping the marital home. Even, you know, they'll say, well, I have three kids, Two are in college, one still in high school, and I really want for the for the security of my college kids, I want them to be able to come home on breaks in the summer, be in their old room, blah 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 blah. But when you get divorced, and if you have a house, when and it's jointly titled, if you are going to in divorce, one person would take you take the other person off the title. So let's say the mother would own the house. But she now has to refinance the house, refinance the mortgage in her own name. Can she qualify? You know, when you get a mortgage, they want to know your income. They want to know your credit. Um, and so we will work, we CDFAs can work to try to negotiate. Um, a lender may want to see six months of regular child or spousal support, and they want the marital settlement agreement to say that for at least three years, you will be getting this monthly amount from your spouse in child and or spouse support. That can help you qualify for a mortgage. But you may not be able to afford it. And the one issue you gotta realize, a lot of people, especially in San Diego, have owned homes for a very long time, especially like in Point Loma, they got these homes very inexpensively, and now these things are worth over a million dollars. And if you are to sell a house while you're married or soon thereafter, and you have a gain, you do not have to pay capital gains tax on the first $500,000 of gain. So if you bought a house for $200,000 and you can sell it for $600,000, if it's a primary residence, even though you've made a $400,000 gain when you sell it, you don't have to pay any capital gains tax while you're, if you sell it as a couple because you have a $500,000 exemption. But if one spouse takes ownership of the house, finds out I can't afford it, I just can't afford it, I gotta sell this house. They try to sell the house later, you can only get an exemption for 250,000 of capital gains tax. So meaning that if I bought it for 200, sold it for 600, if I sell as a single person now, that $400,000 gain, 
I have to pay capital gains tax on 150,000 of it. So another reason why I often encourage divorcing couples, you may need to sell the house because women will do anything they can to keep that house and they will give up the pension. The husband might have a pension, which is worth a lot more than the house, I help value that, and they may say, I don't care, I want to keep the house. So it's really important when you're negotiating divorce to know what 50-50 is. You may not agree, you may agree to be more or less generous, but you should know what 50-50 is. And then um, a lot of people are going or getting divorced through mediation instead of litigation. That's a real good career path if any of you thinking about becoming attorneys. <laughs> Uh, mediation, you don't have to go to court, and you're amicably, you have a mutual mediator that helps you and your spouse divorce. It's much less expensive than hiring attorneys to litigate. And then you've got to have realistic expectations on child and spouse's support. Again, that's why I say if you've been out, I'm working on a case right now where, you know, the, um, the husband's the breadwinner, the wife, they have two small children, and she's going to go back and get a teaching credential now because she's been out of the workforce. but. You know, the child and spouse's support that he's going to have to pay is going to drain him so badly that he's not going to be able to put anything towards his 401k anymore, and she's going to have barely enough. You know, because two residences, it's more expensive for people to live in two places than two people to live in one place. Any questions, comments on this? Yes? So, can you give an example on when one spouse buys out the other spouse on the house? Yes. Great question. So we've, we've heard of these buyouts. So let's say, let's say the house, if you sold the house, you could get a million dollars for the house. And let's say there's $800,000 in the mortgage. So the equity is $200,000. I'm, I'm ignoring brokerage fees and closing costs, which could be six to eight percent. But let's just say you have, you know, the value of the house is a million, there's an $800,000 mortgage, the, the equity is 200000 You share that 200000 in equity. So if you sold the house, you'd each get $100,000 and wouldn't have to pay capital gains tax on it. This is not an investment property, I'm talking about the marital home, the principal residence. So if you want to stay in the house and buy your spouse out, he is going to need to be whole because he knows if you sold it, he'd get 100000 So you have to find a way to give him 100000 in other assets in the marriage. Maybe there's retirement accounts um, or you could maybe do a cash out refinance. You could now, instead of borrow eight hundred, you would borrow 900000 which is probably, I mean, I'm using that high example just to say how hard it is because are you going to qualify for a $900,000 mortgage, but you could get $100,000 to pay them out. Or what a lot of people uh, I do, I work on, is I do spousal support buyouts. Has anyone heard of net present value analysis? The finance people will know. So basically, um, you're nodding. Net present value is we basically, if, if, uh, if I agree to pay spousal support of $2,000 a month for four years, 2000 a month times one year is $24,000 a year times four years is gonna be a little less than 100,000. The net present value is a little less because the theory goes is that if you could invest money that you receive now in like the treasury bond and earn 3% over four years, you know that there would be more money later. So. I can't explain in two minutes net present value, but basically there's a way that we can tell you what's the value today of four years worth of spousal support payments that will be paid monthly. It's, it's taking the net present value of an annuity, annuity stream. And you could say, look, you would have to probably give me 2,000 a month in spousal support. How about you just, I don't take any spousal support, I keep the house. So that's what we would call spousal support buyout. So there's different ways to do it. Um, but remember, if you refinance a house, remember, a lot of people think they can just assume the mortgage that they've already had, but it's very rare. You're going to have to refinance and qualify for a new mortgage in your own name and probably have a higher interest rate. So in, in big issues, it's, it's, it's hard. A lot of people have to sell the house, you know? 
Um, all right, before, well, I'll, I can take questions, but so I always say, you know, biggest compliment is referring friends and family if they ever need help, anything I do. Um, and uh, I would love to take more questions. Any co questions, comments? We can also talk about any investing if you want. Yes. Uh, so just as a college student, kind of um, working with uh, sufficient income right now, uh, what would you say would be maybe like the easiest way to kind of set some money aside for future retirement or maybe like uh, kind of invest in a vehicle? Just Roth to IRA. Roth IRA. Yeah. Um, I love the Roth IRA um, when you're starting out in your career. Is that you, you have a Roth? Or you, um, have the, yeah. you have a Roth. Okay. So what a Roth IRA <clears throat> is. So it's called a Roth Individual Retirement Account. If you are under 50, you are permitted to put up to $5,500 a year in a Roth IRA. It can be opened at almost any bank or financial institution. Really, there's 100 places you could open one. And in that account, you have to decide how it is going to be invested. Do I put it in mutual funds? Do I put it in individual stocks? Do I put it in bonds? Do I put it in real estate investment trusts? You know, the universe of investments. Uh, I can buy funds that track the price of gold. Um, the Roth IRA is good because you don't have to put 5,500 in. That's just the max you can do, and you will. You don't get a tax deduction. It's after-tax money, but this will be grow. It will grow and invest without having to pay taxes on it every year. And when you take it out, you don't have to take it out at a certain age. But when you take it out, you'll never pay taxes on it. Also, it's like a, a great savings account vehicle because if you have to take it before retirement, you are always able to take out the principal you contributed at any time. You just may not be able to take out the er investment earnings without paying a penalty. So that's a great way. But if you, as you start going in your career and earning more money, you may be inclined to do a traditional IRA or participate in your workplace retirement plan because then you, money that you put in that type of retirement plan is deducted from your annual income and you pay less federal and state tax that way. So both vehicles are wonderful and a lot of employers now are offering both a traditional 401k and a Roth 401k. And I always say the younger you are, and the longer time horizon you have for that money, you want to be more in stocks, you want to be more aggressive. If you think, if you're putting funding a Roth IRA and you want money for a down, if you're saving for a down payment for a house in the next five years, you do not want that money to be in the stock market because stocks go up and down. So the longer, if you don't need the money for 10 years or more, you want to be mostly stocks. If you need money, if you're going to, any cash you're going to need to access, in the next six months, year, it should not be invested in the stock market. I'm being conservative, but there's other alternatives. Certificates of deposit, CDs, high yielding savings accounts, they may only make 2% a year, but hopefully it'll keep up with inflation. Any other questions, comments? All right, thank you very much, everyone.